everybody, welcome to the Matt Sky Podcast. Today, we have Sarah Coward from In The Room, uh, a unique platform combining the human side of what it is that makes us, well, human, and artificial intelligence. Sarah, thanks so much for jumping on today. Fantastic to be here in the room with you, actually, Matt. So that's great. Yes, in this room, exactly, uh, <laughs> not in the room. So you have a pretty distinct technology, and it, it's quite different than a lot of the offerings we're seeing in AI. So maybe if you can just walk us through the technology and how you founded the company, I think that would be a great starting point. We'll kind of go from there. Sure. Yeah, no problem. So I'll start with the the origins, really, because it really grounds things. And we've got a slightly different origin story, I think, to a lot of companies working in conversational AI at the moment. Um, so many years ago, I was working at the National Holocaust Center and Museum in the cultural sector. And the museum had a fantastic education program. They work with 20,000 kids every year. And every time the kids visit, they have the opportunity to meet a survivor of the Holocaust. And the kids sit in the memorial hall, the survivor walks in, sits opposite them and shares their witness testimony, you know, shares their story of what happened to them as kids and what happened to them when they came over to the UK as refugees. And even though those kids are kind of 14, you know, 14 year old teenagers, not necessarily focused on education 24 seven. Yeah, that's you not often, the age where you are. <laughs> it's, it's not the age really, yeah. is it? And they're on a school trip. You can often hear a pin drop in that room. Wow. Be because they are realizing this is kind of a special, a special moment when they get to meet, a, meet a witness of history. And then the, the, the museum realized that in the future, all that moment when they met a witness was going to be lost. So how could they think about preserving that core part of the education program? So in 20, sort of 2014, 2015, we started sort of researching solutions to that and thinking, can we use new technologies to preserve that sense of presence and that encounter? So we worked on a an installation at the museum, which integrated voice recognition, conversational AI, and life-size 3D media video to basically create a, a life-size encounter with a survivor where you could ask questions to the image and get a response straight away. That's so that's where we started. It's a very powerful start and, and it definitely resonates on my end. I had a, um, I think we had talked about this earlier. So uh, Holocaust, a hidden child uh, surviving father. Yeah. And then on my aunt's side, she had much more vivid recollections. And I can just think if they were alive, this would have been something so powerful to be able to show, uh, yeah. you know, so many young kids, but also just family members as well. And this is something that's Brilliant. applicable to anyone. It kind of can preserve a very vivid memory of people you care about. But this is just one of the many potential commercial and then, uh, you know, obviously uh, personal applications. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And and I think that's just your uh, you're talking about your family story. Um, everyone. Everyone is you has a unique element to how they describe things, how they um, their own personal sort of lived experience of whatever it was. And it's it's that element of someone's unique experience that really connects with other humans we're, because we're interested in people, we're interested in people's individual lives and um, way of approaching the world. Well, yeah, and it's all those little subtle things too, right? It's those kind of, and I notice you have those in the videos If when you look at In the Room, it's like you have kind of the head scratch and the kind of, uh, it's all those little imperfections that make us, us very real. So it's uh it's it's a powerful experience and it is true for anyone listening you definitely have to try it in the room dot global and just once you see it it's like oh okay I'm getting it now because <laughs> it's not yeah, the same but... as it's not the same as that conventional interview we always feel like we're a fly on the wall but this is very it's very intimate intimate I'm glad you used the word that uh, that word because um uh it's a really interesting experience. So when we spun the company out of the work at the museum, we really wanted to create something that was scalable. So the work at the museum had been quite 
um, quite expensive. It'd been very uh, life size experience, sort of immersive experience. And, and what we really wanted to do was create something that had that sense of intimacy and presence, but in a way that brought that to you, the audience, wherever you were, you know, on your mobile device, on your desktop. So we thought very hard about, you know, how you can create that intimacy and sense of presence. And now that's really coming through with our applications across different industries and, and fields in terms of the feedback that people are giving. So I think to familiarize people with what conversational media is, uh, this is quite distinct from what we're starting to see this big acceleration of. Obviously, we're seeing an enormous number of deep fakes or ways mm -hmm. to implement your voice into an app and then it responds for you. So chat bots, we're seeing large language learning models. Uh, this is actually, in some ways, its elegance is sort of in its, um, I, I guess you'd say it's more historic uh, roots in terms of you actually are hearing a real recording from a person and then prompted by AI. AI. Um, but maybe if you can tell us, I'm assuming I'm, I'm explaining it correctly, uh, but if you can maybe walk us through conversational media and some of the inner technology behind uh, what power is in the room, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So it's sort of founded on the basis that human connections drive business and um, drive engagement with companies and organizations. And authentic human conversations are the things that kind of fuel and create the glue for those human connections. So um, I sort of see this sort of synthetic media and what we use authentic media and video, audio, generally authentically gathered as being sort of different, different parts of a spectrum that the conversation AI field kind of operates within. So what we do, instead of using synthetic media, which creates a, tries to sort of humanize AI. So in other words, right. you've got the kind of AI and then you're trying to make it seem more human by layering on something that looks human or tries to look human. We kind of do it the other way around, focusing on you're starting with the human and you're using AI to amplify or leverage that human voice. So in our conversational media experiences, you can ask questions to an individual using your voice or text, uh, primarily voice, and then the conversation AI matches your, in quest your question to the answer that has been um, previously provided by the, the the talent or the celebrity or the expert or whoever's featured in the experience. So it creates many... a kind of... Oh, no, go ahead. So it creates a, a sort of one-to-one, face-to-face conversation, a bit like a Zoom call, but a high-quality one, that anybody can access at, at any time. Just occurs to me, like when I was accidentally overstepping your question it would be <laughs> that maybe that's a feature to add to add that extra humanity right <laughs> like you can have the accidental interrupt option oh no sorry you go ahead go. that could be a whole <laughs> yeah, a whole yeah you can feature. actually interrupt yeah you can interrupt people actually on our on our um yeah. experiences which is which is quite funny but um but it, like you were just saying actually or saying before that's all the little bits you know 80 percent of our communication with with each other as humans is supposed to be body language and, and tone and emotion and all of the other things that through thousands of years of evolution we've attuned ourselves to. Um, so that's where conversational media is about bringing that whole media experience and the, the whole sense of presence to an AI dri driven conversation. Um, rather than trying to sort of squeeze out all the humanity. It's a very powerful way of putting it. And, you know, I've never really thought about it like that before, but you're right. You're taking the entire evolution of humanity. And when you go with natural video, you have this inherent advantage, something that we're very obviously programmed to be familiar with, or however you want to perceive it, if it's in our spirit or whatever it may be, it's, it's a part of us for, for many, many eons. And then what we're trying to do is kind of create the artificial representation of that experience. Not quite there yet. Um, 
But this is the question that I have for you. When we get there, then in the room to me serves a different unique purpose because it's going to be the way that we can verify a human interaction when we can't tell the difference anymore between what is or isn't. When you have programmed in all those little subtleties and someone says, I, I don't know which one is which. That's right. I think there's I think that's why I like to see it as a spectrum. So, you know, we're focusing on the authentic element. And at the other end, there are lots of great companies who are doing great work on synthetic media um, ethically and appropriately. And then you've also got this, obviously, the, 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 the dark arts that where people can apply it in 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 bad ways. So I think there are a lot of issues that are going to be coming up with regards to how organizations and how companies develop trust through the way in which they approach artificial intelligence their own media and the way in which they are um, displaying or confirming what they are giving to people so i think a lot of the distinctions in the future will be around proving or demonstrating that your media is authentic um, showing we've talked about um sort of le nutritional labels around, you know, uh, what am I seeing? I was going to say, like a little badge. It's just this is yeah, a yeah. human badge, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then even if you have something which is slightly mixed media, um, potentially using text input as well, then you have something where you as an organisation can be very clear about what you're providing to people and why. Um, I think that's going to be really critical, particularly because there'll be legislation coming in the future about ethically how ethically and legally how are you displaying this media and where does it come from and there's great work being done by the content authenticity initiative which is run sort of led by adobe and others to really start to develop sort of tech solutions to how you can prove what a piece of media started out as and what happened to it subsequent to its capture so all of those sorts of things are going to be really important in the future. And then uh, I think especially just that idea that when, you know, we're talking about companies, right? When a founder wants to uh, interact in a more contemporary way with people online, it is true they're moving into this chatbot style back and forth mm -hmm. way of, uh, of having dialogue. But this is a way to sort of protect and just individuals as well, protect your actual viewpoints, protect your actual perspective of the world, uh, not... Uh, typing in your voice and then hoping that the bot gets it, <laughs> so to speak. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of legal trouble coming down the road, I think. For... Oh, my gosh. I can't imagine oh, right now. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine talent, some talent might already be sort of slightly signing away the rights that their image rights or digital digital voice rights without necessarily really thinking about what the potential consequences of that that are. So I think there's going to be a lot of things that both legally from a regulation point of view and from your own personal protection of your own self represented digitally. It, it's something that people have got to be very conscious of how they sort of step into this new world and, and what they're going to let people do with their representation of themselves. Are you finding when you speak to people and you're recently at Project Voice 2023, um, you know, in Chattanooga, it sounds like a, an amazing <laughs> event with a lot of uh, different people from many different walks of life working on these technologies. Just out of curiosity, and I have a lot of questions about the event, but do you feel that people understand the scale of what is happening? Like, do they see how immense this acceleration is? Because I keep saying to people, even if let's say we just stay around that GPT-4 level, mid-journey, like what we have right now, even if we don't see acceleration, the real power of AI is going to be uh, integration into everything. It's that implementing it into all the programs, you know, 56K modem versus having internet on our iPhone or in this video call like we're having now. That's where you saw this immense transformation. And as it's becoming more and more a part of everything, uh, I'm not sure people are fully ready for the change that's about to take place societally. I think that is true. Um, I really enjoyed being at the conference and there are a lot of great people in that industry who are thinking, I think, 
very carefully and ethically about what they're doing. Um, it also felt for me almost like you're on the cusp pioneering is probably probably right. the right word so i think it was appropriate that it, it it's in america particularly at this time because there's a sense of something is being 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 built and developed and it is a pioneering time there's there's a there's a worry about that and a lot of concern about ethics that we have to take very seriously and at the end of the conference the, the opportunity to sign the ethics and ai charter uh, which project voice and its other partners obviously really want to build awareness of of, of the ethical issues um, but at the same time there's such a feeling of potential and yeah. the what this could do and the unknown opportunity that is in front of everybody and, and everyone there is a pioneer in their field in some way, shape or form. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I think I think you're right. It's balancing out the uh, potential ethical concerns. But then I, I kind of agree. I'm seeing certain AI experts jumping on a lot of interviews and they're telling us all the doom and gloom and the warnings and the jobs that are going to disappear. And I'm thinking that's that's half the story, right? Because we can potentially unlock so much of our own uh, human intelligence and potential and create so many new jobs. We're at the cusp of just this spectacular revolution. I, and, and you don't want to leave out the optimism, particularly because like at this event, you want to encourage the best and brightest minds to jump into this field and to start innovating. That's right. And and I, I think it's really brilliant that there are people who are highlighting their serious concerns vocally and on big stages because that is you can't get that wrong um but at the same time having this consideration of the potential um and the opportunity that's there one of the things one of my big takeaways i think from the conference was actually how much people were talking about the human experience so you'd imagine at a conversation AI conference, a lot of it would be almost exclusively technical presentations or, uh, but actually right. a, a lot of presentations were talking about the importance of keeping humans in the loop, how customer experience was more than just uh, um, AI and an artificial one. You needed to be thinking about how your customer was connecting with the, the people in your business and what service you were giving. Um, empathy was talked about much more than I thought it would have been before. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and also some great companies doing work that you know, could be transformational for people. So Canary have been, look, Canary Speech, they've been looking at how to identify different health conditions through speech patterns. So using voice AI and speech AI in a way, a sort of diagnostic tool or something that can support people in the health field uh, to understand health conditions better. No, I mean, I think that's, uh, to me, that's great to hear. And I think, yeah, we're seeing the technological upgrades, but are we seeing the empathy, humanity upgrades in that sense, like ourselves? Are we, are we living up to the moment? Because the tech is becoming that significant. Um, were there any, just out of curiosity, any major sessions that stood out or any insights that you saw there that uh, connected to the work you're doing in the room where you said, wow, this is this is something? I think definitely there was a great panel on customer experience and that has touched on really, it f focused on and highlighted how AI has a role to play in supporting customer engagement but brands and some brands who have moved too quickly to take humans out of customer experience in order to save costs mm. have damaged their brands and lost revenues as a result so there was the careful articulation of how companies can get the balance right between you know leveraging 
potential of AI to support their business, but not thinking about AI as being a technical solution. It's implemented in a technical way, but you're not using it as a technical solution. Often you're using it as a way in which you can support your customer journey and your customer experience in those applications. So when we're talking about conversational AI, so um, you kind of really want to remember that you're starting with the customer and moving back from that rather than starting with what is possible technically and kind of getting to the customer at the end of that there's a kind of side note and and i i do and i do actually think that that some some companies um or some organizations slightly lose their way on on technical solutions right. because sometimes they can think purely about what is possible with the technology rather than is this something that is going to make our business better or help us engage our customers etc so it's um it's interesting yeah, it's like the idea of trying to get as many um, calls in as you can. Like, how many uh, customer service reps do we still need? Can we just get it all done without? And then here you are, the poor customer on the phone, just yelling, customer service, customer service, customer. <laughs> We've all that's, had that's that experience. It. You just keep saying it, and then it puts you in a loop. Customer service. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what somebody used as an example. And, and that people were saying that it was... Um, it's brilliant when you have a lot of technical support and conversational agents to, to, but it's got to result in a better experience for your customers, Absolutely. not a worse experience for your customers. Otherwise, it, it's, it, it, it defeats the object, really. So I guess, um, just curious, what, what, what was the, and then I, I want to move past uh, this one conference and back to the in, in the room exclusively, but I guess my last two questions would be, what was the general sentiment in terms of, of humans uh, being able to be mimicked by these technologies? What was the, the thought process mm -hmm. on that? Was there, uh, you know, these kinds of concerns and excitement? And just curious to kind of get what people's thoughts are, because it seems like it's coming quicker than we think, as far as I can tell. I know it looks pretty artificial now, generally, most of the uh, representations, but, you know, yeah. it's happening I, I, I think we're a lot i think we're a lot closer on voice than we are unless you're talking serious deep fakes which obviously need a lot of video content and um, right. training uh, so on the deep fake this is my view on the deep fake front where you're working you're starting with video i mean like the tom cruise deep fakes they both use Sorry, video of, <laughs> yeah they the use the, they, exactly yeah. they they use they use the video and they use an actor who look who look very similar to tom cruise and then they lay it on top of that so right. um there's a lot of training involved in in that but that's getting sort of easier and better but i think generally where we are at the moment is the voice voice cloning and voice um voice seems to be easier for us to process um, rather than the physical avatars that still are still straying into that sort of uncanny valley territory and are, are quite challenging for people to connect with um, in, in certain instances. But it is getting it is getting a lot better. Um, but so there are a number of different companies at Project Voice that were delivering good quality voice cloning um, experiences. Like, and like so, well said and play. Fantastic. And so I think we talked a little bit about this offline, but you know, there, you, you had a, a, your own speech there and it seemed to me you were mentioning people, you could see an observable emotional reaction to in the room, which I think is so, so awesome. This, uh, this idea that, Hey, we don't have to lose ourselves as we progress through this technology. Can you talk? Yeah, about I was. I was, uh, it was really rewarding to do the closing keynote and I was really conscious that what we were doing, as I said, sort of dovetailed on this sort of spectrum of, of, of conversational AI, but, you know, presenting a few, few challenges and, and, and reminding people about the value of human experience and, and, and what's important about the way in which we convey our experience and our, our passions and it, wisdom and knowledge to other people and at the end there were a lot of people coming up and some of them were actually a bit emotional about that 
I think because so much of the worries or concerns that people have about, about AI is that somehow humans become less relevant. Mm -hmm. whereas, whereas actually, I fundamentally think that our experiences as people and as people as, who have unique stories and um, unique lives and unique perspectives, actually everything that's happening at the moment makes us focus on why are we interested in other people? Why do we want to talk to other people? What do we think is important about making that human connection? And it actually kind of clarifies people's minds about, yeah, I want to meet this person or talk to this person or be inspired by this person because they actually have that experience, because they've actually lived that life. And that's very different from assuming that everything is to do with everything can be replicated by artificial intelligence which isn't the case um there is a we'll still have relevance even though we're not artificial going forward i hope well it almost makes me a little teary-eyed thinking about it because really when you get to the the essence of humanity uh it's mm. it is all of those things that we think shouldn't happen in our lives all the hardships all the problems all the many times horrible things but at the end that's also what makes us human and no matter how sophisticated the ai gets that unique perspective of someone who's had uh, a range of highs and lows and, and all of the things that that uh make up a life that that's the very fundamental essence of who we are it is. And I think that's why it's such an important moment to kind of think quite deeply about that from a philosophical point of view. A, an artificial person will never have fallen in love or been depressed or, or suffered loss or worn any clothes or been hungry or, you know, felt sympathy for somebody. And, and actually, as you sort of imply there, those are some of the things that we're most, I mean, it's like when you're, you have sort of um, entrepreneurs on, on podcasts or, or you, you want to be sort of inspired or connect with somebody. You need to know that they've actually lived through those challenges and that they've I've faced stared into something. the abyss. <laughs> stared <laughs> into the abyss. Yeah. That's right. Stared into the abyss or had personal challenges or how they've overcome those. And, um, that's because we live, we are alive and we, we live an experience and we live a life. Perfect imperfection, I guess you could say. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Let's dive a little bit into uh, the conversational commerce components of this, how businesses can utilize um, in the room, how it uh, plays a role in terms of customer engagement, how, how in the room is distinct from other offerings. I think we definitely see the philosophical side and the emotional side, uh, sort of in the nitty gritty, I'm a business, I want to make uh, more sales, get more conversions, uh, connect with my customers. How, how does that process work? Completely. So sort of drawing that thread really from some of the things that we've just been talking about, a lot of companies that we work with want to be able to get closer to their customers, to answer their questions, but also connect with them as people. So often, um, for example, there's a, a wine online wine retailer called Vinateca, and it's founded by two great people, Charlie and Brett, and they are really passionate about, about wine. They're very knowledgeable about wine. And if you actually go into one of their physical stores, that is infectious. You know, that's something that they can bring directly to people face to face. But when they were developing their online wine presence, they really were thinking about how can they be in the room with with every with every customer? You know, how can they actually sort of share that knowledge and expertise to support to, to support their online wine offer? So now you can actually go on to the website. Charlie and Brett are sitting there as the owners and founders waiting for you to ask a question about what wine goes with fish or how cold does how should i open a bottle of sparkling wine how cold should my white wine be whatever it happens to be and then those those conversational points can lead directly to purchase for different items that they might recommend 
Oh, well, you know what's funny and it reminds me? Oh, go ahead. And the, the other, just actually something else which is happening, just happened actually, just launched on a website. It's another company, there are areas where healthcare, health-related products or products that require some level of privacy, this is also really appropriate for because customers buying something that um, may be sort of underwear or which is the company we've been working with, they might not want to be asking questions in a shop or calling somebody up. So there are things where people can ask questions about a health product or a well-being product or, or something to do with a particular issue that they're facing and get a response straight away. Well, sort of the perfect collision of privacy meets a more intimate human discussion and you can exactly. kind of get the best of both worlds. What strikes me is it's it's interesting because we moved into this world of very, very efficient purchasing. You know, the, the, the mega store or the online store and everything is very, very, very hyper, hyper efficient. <clears throat> this kind of brings back the feeling of a boutique shop, right? In a sense, you can be a huge store, but you can still have... Um, that one-on-one -on -one expertise, you're, you're meeting with the shopkeep, so to speak, uh, getting to know the person who's selling the products. And I think this is so funny to me because we look at shopping and we kind of, I think at some point people felt, oh, the mall or the downtowns are going to disappear for good. No one will ever use them, but that has not been the case. People still do want mm -hmm. that experience of shopping, that human experience of shopping, the bazaar, if you will. Uh, this kind of brings it back in a digital form. Definitely, definitely. And that um, sense of we did some research into parasocial relationships, which you normally have with audiences, normally have with famous people. So they feel like they know that famous person as a as a, almost like a friend. But it it's that sort of relationship that the, the audience has with an individual, but it feels intimate. It feel, you used the word intimate earlier on. It feels close. It feels personal. And yeah, exactly, this is about creating that boutique or corner shop experience for everyone in a way that doesn't make it feel like a, a, a mass anonymous market, that you can feel like you know the owner of that business a little bit or or their product expert or their salesperson. I find that myself actually because we've got a mini experience of me on our website <laughs> and um, quite often when I'm speaking to people for the first time they say oh I've actually I actually feel like I know you a little bit or I've already right. asked you a few questions and it's really interesting as for me to experience that as well. Why do you think that is, though? Because I, I noticed it, too. When you use in the room and when you're speaking face to face, there is a, a degree of, of um, connectedness that you don't quite get from an interview, which is so interesting. You know, I mean, you watch a lot of fantastic. I don't know if it's the angle. I mean, if, you know, if it's better to be facing, but it is there is just something much, much more uh, vivid about this format. I think that's a really interesting comment and we launched our first web experience with Universal Music and the National Portrait Gallery featuring Niall Rogers, the US musician, guitarist and all round. One of the celebrities, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, all round legend, music legend. And mm -hmm. when we first tested that with some of his fans, some of them gave us really interesting feedback that we kind of hadn't really been expecting. Um, so some said that they were nervous when he walks into the screen, because in the Nile Rogers in the room experience, <laughs> right? in the Nile Rogers in the room yeah. experience, that there's an empty chair opposite you, and, and then you, you can hear him playing the guitar in the background, and then he walks on and sits in front of you. And his fans sort of said, oh, I'm a bit nervous when he's sort of sitting opposite me. And um, someone said they were slightly embarrassed because they were wearing their pajamas. Um, right. Even though they had no reason to be nervous because it wasn't a live call. Program so in I... the uh, pajama critique. I yeah, that's right. Oh, no, should I be wearing, <laughs> should I be wearing something else? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but I think that it, the nature of it creates a different dynamic that's slightly, it creates more responsibility on the audience member, actually. They can't just sit back and be broadcast to and be looking at their phone or, you know, making a cup of tea. It's something that they need to participate in. Mm -hmm. So it changes that dynamic slightly that they also have a role to play. So it actually gets them to pay more attention because they're involved in creating the interview rather than just watching the interview. It reminds me 100% of what you see when you do, and I've done some stand-up comedy, and that's something Good where you him. absolutely have to have that two-way. Yeah, you have to have that two-way interaction um, because uh, that's terrifying. Yeah, though. Stand-up's yeah. <laughs> terrifying. Very impressed you've done that. Well, yeah, my worst set ever was when my parents uh, came to see me, and it was just a bad night. It just didn't work out. You know, it's a crowd, different crowds. Uh, some of them like you, some of them don't. Like, this is what yeah. you're doing with your life? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just complete oh, silence. Oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah. But it is interesting because it's different than um, music, and and this format is different because it, you're right, it, it, it it almost asks the viewer to, to become more of a, a, an engaging part of a dialogue rather than just exactly. neutrally uh, sit back and, and watch. And, and very often we do. We see it in real life meetings. If we're at a, a, a big meeting and there's 20 people speaking, sometimes you just kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just kind of start to tune out. So so yeah. when someone's looking right at you, there is this uh, this degree of a maybe a very primitive level of attention that comes up. Absolutely right. Yeah, I think it, it changes the dynamic completely from standard linear, linear video or linear experiences, I think. And that is where things are going um, for the future. I think that, that our basic, our basic mode as humans is generally an interactive conversational approach. That is how we get through life every single day pretty much so it's a very I think we're on the cusp of this we've gone through a lot of years when everything was broadcast at us so we were these sort of consumers mm -hmm. of media without participating as much and I think now there's going to be this evolution of participation in what you're consuming in a different way, which I, I hope will create one of one of the parts of our mission is actually sort of foster curiosity and encourage that engagement uh, through this type of interactive approach. Well, it also it also engages um, sides of us that maybe have atrophied a bit, right? I mean, we are so used mm. to pre uh, pre texting. <laughs> you kind of had to develop a certain degree of social skills to navigate in the world. And now you can just send off a quick little text. Maybe you become bolder in saying things, but you're never really standing behind what you say. So I feel like this is an incredible opening there as well. Mm, yeah, I think that's really, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, you do have to sort of put yourself out there a bit, but also there's a level of privacy. So we, we're going to be working with the uh, Auckland University of Technology on a piece of work with a member of the Maori community in New Zealand. And one of the things that they want to achieve is a label, give people a safe space in order to ask a member of the community questions that they might have been embarrassed to ask, or they might have felt was a bit of a stupid mm -hmm. question in quotes. So I think there's also that, that what we want to try and achieve is that balance between it feels live and it feels present and it feels immediate, but actually it does provide a 24 seven safe space for customers or audiences to, to have that moment, but when they choose to have it. No, that's a really important thing. So it's authentic, but you're not feeling embarrassed to ask a yeah. question. You, you feel exactly. like you can, you can say what you really want to say. Exactly. Um, jumping into that, uh, along those lines, you, uh, you have so many different use cases and interesting companies just across the board. Are there are there any industries you're targeting or that you see as a best fit 
for in the room and, and its technology? Absolutely. So there are two two big markets that we're actively working in. So marketing communications focused on developing both our, the offer to SME, sort of small small businesses, but also um, large enterprise businesses for not necessarily customer service because there's an element of transaction around that, um, but the richer opportunities to explain or explore product or communications around that. So we've got a lot of applications in market around that sort of marketing communications and e-commerce approach. And then secondly, sort of lifelong learning, um, another big sort of chunky industry. So we're working with a number of different organizations, some of which I can't really talk about on this on this podcast, but um, in the education and learning field, including corporate training organizations, universities and publishing related organizations, too. That's great. And in terms of, I, I guess, the technology, right, when you work with a client, um, how are you currently creating uh, these conversations? And then I, I guess I would I, I would sort of second that with how long does a session need to take before it starts becoming a uh, enough of a library, if you will, to feel like a convincing back and forth? Yeah, so one of the things we're really keen on and we know through working with customers across different types of businesses is a lot of businesses have very specific offers you know as a business you, you you want to be able to convey exactly what your business does and what what the product is and what you're offering and that sounds really obvious but a lot of conversational solutions out there out there right now um have a quite a generic approach with regards to transactions etc um, so what we provide is the opportunity for the company or organization to curate their question list, to collect their media, which either they can do themselves or, or we can help them with that. And then all of the heavy lifting technically is done by our done by our platform. So at the customer, our customer end, it's a very simple, simple process. And how um, how does the AI side work? I guess whether there's a conversational AI component. Uh, obviously, it's um, listening for certain keywords. Um, maybe if as much as you can, of course, without giving away the secret sauce. What is what are sort of the technical under under the hood uh, aspects to this? Yeah. So our, uh, we covered touch on a little bit before. So our our platform, our creation platform brings together our own proprietary code base um, with conversation AI, voice recognition and the media assets and enables the creation of those into a sort of seamless experience. Um, it works on the basis of seeking to understand the intent behind the question that's asked and then matching that to the most appropriate answer within the pre-recorded um, data set. And I guess if it doesn't fit, then I've noticed they just kind of tell you. <laughs> Sorry, I again. can't. Yeah, I can't yeah. answer that one. Or you can yeah. link it to another another asset or another website. Um, right. You can also play around with that, to be honest. You can make that quite amusing if you want to, depending on the, 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 the application or the, the use case. And you'd also asked about the amount of content that you need. Right, right. And that really depends on... The particular use case so for example specific product applications if you know that that conversation is about a very narrow domain so you're asking about one particular product or, or something like that you might not need that much content in order to provide still a very sort of satisfying experience for the audience if it's something which is a bit broader, so we worked with McLaren Formula One um, and their brand partner on an experience with Mika Hakkinen, the previous Formula One driver in the 1990s. And that was about his his career and about his experience 
driving for McLaren. So that required more content because it was it was wider. What's the uh, I guess what's the minimum and what's the maximum number of hours you've seen for a session? Just curious. Has anyone because when you think of an audio book, people will spend, uh, you know, many, 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 many weeks making sure they fill that up. And I, I could imagine someone potentially if they really want a great experience could just you know, every day put an hour in <laughs> answering Yeah, absolutely. And, so and I'd say the min- yeah. Yeah, so I think the minimum we've done is probably about 30 minutes filming. Okay. And the maximum would be our work with Holocaust survivors, which was about five days. So they answered between 800 and 1400 questions. Wow, that's amazing. So that uh, that's, that's you can see where that really makes a difference. Yeah, that's so, it. That's more of a legacy piece, really. I mean, that that has its own value in being a historical media repository as well as everything else. Whereas the at the other end, uh, we actually just done something with a, a YouTube influencer who's done about thirty five minutes of sort of top tips on how to make your content go viral and it's really good useful tips um so i can't remember how many questions he did i think it's probably about 40 so but 40 really good how do i do this how do i you know basically one-to-one with an expert in that field so that will be coming out soon which will be good oh that's so cool yeah that's the pinnacle of everyone trying to find some way there's got to be a way i can go viral (laughs) Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you can sit down. We used with to want son. to accomplish all kinds of other things, but now the pinnacle of society. I must go viral somehow, whatever it takes. Whatever <laughs> it takes. Blue on my face. I don't care. I need to go. Yeah, yeah. Um, out of curiosity, you know, you're mentioning the Holocaust survivor uh, sessions. What what are the common questions that come up? Because at that point, when you have that much content, presumably someone can ask anything. So kind of looking mm-hmm. at the other side, I'm just curious, what what are the most common questions you saw arising in that instance, in that age group? Well, it was around like 14, right? I think you were saying kind of in, around there. Yeah. I mean, some of the survivors were experienced in talking to younger children. So for the younger kids, primary school children, where they are talking to refugees, so people who had left, um, left mainland Europe, for example, on the kinder transport that brought brought um, thousands of kids to the to the UK before 1939. Um, some of those younger kids' questions are fantastic in their innocence and their desire to understand more. So, some of them might be, "Did you meet Hitler? Um, wow. you, did you find it difficult to speak English when you came to the UK? You know, all these very kind of child related questions but that have real meaning for kids at that primary Mm. age and then um some of the questions that are asked by by older children and adults you know some of them are very challenging you know uh, do you forgive do you forgive the people that did these things to you and your family um how do you feel about about germany now have you been back have you visited the camps um What was the worst thing that happened to you? All sorts of questions that that uncover and explore very challenging themes, um, but provide an experience for people that makes a difference to them. Make it makes a difference in how they think about the world as a result of having this type of conversation. Very powerful. In terms of the platform, you know, as we sort of wrap up here a little bit, uh, in terms of the platform evolving, expanding over time, uh, what can we expect to see? Any any big uh, big things uh, coming coming up? Yeah, well, we are going to be releasing our platform at further afield over the coming months, so people ought to keep a, a watch out for that, um, particularly if they want to participate in what we're doing. With We've launched a new way of displaying the experiences, which create sort of embeddable 
uh, floating layers the, to bring conversation experiences more to the fore on websites. Um, you'll see a whole host of sort of new B2B features coming up in, in the future. And we're really focused on making this type of technology and approach accessible. One of the things I've really noticed about a lot of conversational AI is most businesses cannot employ most of the technologies out there really quickly. Mm. I mean, obviously right. there's stuff, go great stuff going on with ChatGPT, et cetera, but you've got other issues around that, around um, trustworthiness and appropriateness for your, for your business and um, how you can really understand what it's going to be putting out for you. Um, so we're really focused on what can businesses use this for now? Not in a year's time after spending $100,000, this can make a difference to your organization within a couple of days. Right, there's that immediate uh, implementation. And you're right, some of these technologies are very, very powerful, but you're not exactly sure what you're putting in. Um, what is the difference you're seeing between B to C and B to B, or just mentioning, you know, the two categories. Are you seeing uh, a, a more demand in one area and the other, and and, and how are the implementations a bit different? Because I I, I'm, I can definitely understand the B to C version, but what does a B to B interaction potentially look like? I think from uh, most of our customers are using our technology in the context of a B to C offer generally. Um, but from a B2B perspective, one of the things that um, B2B companies need to focus on is how can they deliver the details of their product and service comprehensively to other businesses at scale. And so a lot of, a lot of B2B companies actually have a real communication issue that is difficult to scale without humans in the loop because a lot of B2B um, sales are, and connections are done with people. So um, it's one of the, the great applications for what we're doing as well. And as you, uh, as we wrap up, when you help, uh, I guess, businesses curious about jumping in, uh, mm -hmm. where can they start? And, and you do help uh, in that ideation phase, right? You help uh, businesses figure out what kinds mm -hmm. of questions to ask if they're not familiar, maybe where to start. Um, absolutely. Yeah, Which it's great. We've done absolutely. I mean, because we've been working in this field for such a long period of time now, uh, we can make the process very simple for people. So we have advice and guidance and support to really just just set people on the right on the right path. And then people find it a very enjoyable process, actually, once they've got <laughs> once they've got going. Um, yeah, it's 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 a great thing to do, and and it's really rewarding when people are seeing it make an impact. Yeah, so all all a business or a client would potentially need is the desire to do this, and then you'll help uh, guide them through. It sounds like right. Absolutely, and obviously people can reach out on our website, and they can also ask me a few questions on the website. I'm 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 there twenty four seven. So. <laughs> Thank you. And that's uh, in the room .global. Any Anywhere else they should check out? Um, you could check out hereintheroom.com, which is the experience with Nile Rodgers and Universal Music, if you want to take a look at a wider experience uh, and any of the case studies on our main website. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Thanks.